Today we are in the Platte River Valley and headed up to the top of Nebraska. I'm Mark Thaler. Welcome to another episode of Rooftops of America. Today, we're heading up to the highest point in the Cornhusker State. Located in the southwestern corner of the state panhandle, Panorama Point is part of the High Plains section of the Great Plains. The High Point gets its name from the long, unobstructed views an individual can see when standing at the summit. The terrain in this section of Nebraska has more in common with the open ranges of Wyoming and Colorado than the eastern part of the state. Behind me is Interstate 80, one of the major east to west thoroughfares across the United States. Thousands of people have come through here every day. But I really shouldn't be that surprised. This area has been a major crossroads for both humans and animals for centuries. The key to why is the Platte River and its two effluents, the North and South Platts. These rivers flow through Nebraska from west to east. Over time, they carved out a wide valley that had three key features that made it a natural transportation corridor. It was dry, it was flat, and it headed in the right direction. While this area has been a major thoroughfare for centuries, and a funny little bit of geological irony, the river itself is pretty much unnavigable. Now, Native Americans in the area called it Nebraska, meaning flat, and Washington Earth the legend of Sleepy Hollow fame called it the most magnificent, but useless, of rivers. While travel on the river was limited due to its shallowness, it did provide an oasis of sorts, a ribbon of green in the semi-arid high plains. By the 19th century, it became known as the Great Platte River Road and was the superhighway of its time. The list of overland trails that pass this way are an all-star cast in the annals of American westward expansion, including the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, the Mormon Trail, and the Pony Express. Behind me are Courthouse and Jail Rocks. Now, if you were traveling west in the 1800s, these would have been some of the first major landmarks you would have seen. In their heyday, between three to 400,000 people traveled on the emigrant trails. As pioneers headed up the river valley, they came across other landmarks as well, including Chimney Rock and then Scott's Bluff. While these points rise dramatically off the floor of the prairie, even at their highest, they still fall over 1,000 feet short of the state high point. By the late 1860s, the emigrant trails were falling out of use, replaced by the locomotive. The Transcontinental Railroad would be completed in 1869, providing a safer and much faster way across the continent. What used to be a trip of months was now cut down to a matter of days. The Union Pacific Railway ran directly through Kimball, shunting wheat and cattle to points east and west. Adjacent to it was the first coast-to-coast -coast National Telegraph Line, drastically improving communications in the nation. Later, in the 1920s, the first transcontinental airmail route would fly directly overhead as well. The railway has left a lasting mark on this area. Kimball itself was actually created to support the railroad. Originally, this place was known as Antelope or Antelopeville, but in 1885, it was renamed after Thomas Kimball, Vice President and Executive for Union Pacific. Even today, Union Pacific trains still pass through the town. While the railway was and continues to be a primary way to transport goods through the region, in the realm of personal transportation, by the early 1900s, a new contender was making its presence felt. The automobile gave Americans more freedom than ever to explore the country, and demand for the machines meant the United States had to build the roads to support it. This here is the Wheat Growers Hotel in downtown Kimball. It opened its doors in December of 1918, and it was said to be the finest hotel between Omaha and Denver. Now, the success of this hotel depended on two factors. One was the railroad, and the other was the road that ran right in front of its doors. The Lincoln Highway 
was the first cross-country road stretching 3,389 miles from Times Square in New York City to Lincoln Park in San Francisco. In 1919, one of the more noteworthy events in the road's history was the U.S. Army Transcontinental Motor Convoy. Its mission was to test the feasibility of moving troops and material over long distances, in this instance, from coast to coast. It took the 80 vehicles and over 280 men almost two months to make the journey. One of the participants of that endeavor was a brevet lieutenant colonel named Dwight Eisenhower, who later was directly responsible for the creation of the road network that superseded the Lincoln Highway. By the 1950s, the dream of a national road network had existed for over 40 years, but it had failed to become a reality. That would change under the presidency of Eisenhower. His experience on the Lincoln Highway, and then later in World War II with the German Autobahn, allowed him to realize the effectiveness of a robust system of roads. Eisenhower would set in motion what would become known as the Interstate Highway System. Construction would begin in 1956, and as of 2017, the interstate system has almost 47,000 miles of roads nationwide. In Nebraska, the first interstate project began in 1957, and by 1974, the state would be the first to finish its mainline portion. Nowadays, if you're traveling cross-country in this area, you'll probably find yourself on Interstate 80, stretching from Teaneck, New Jersey, right outside of New York City, all the way to San Francisco, California. It comes in at 2,899 and a half miles. It's the second longest interstate in the USA. Now let's turn our attention to the High Point. Kimball calls itself the High Point in Nebraska, and while the county is home to the state's highest point, and the city is the county seat, Kimball itself is not the city with the highest elevation in the state. That title belongs to the village of Harrison, over 100 miles to the north. The High Point itself lies 33 miles away in the southwestern part of the county. There are a few things to keep in mind once you actually get here. The first, pay the requested fee for access. Second, unlike most high points that have a hike or a walk, at Panorama Point, it's strongly recommended that you drive. So let's go check it out. Panorama Point is private property owned by the High Point Bison Ranch. Be respectful and leave no trace. Also, please be sure to watch out for the bison. They always have the right of way. While it may look similar to the high plains of Kansas, Panorama Point is almost 1,400 feet higher than Mount Sunflower. It does share another trait with its neighbor to the south. It, like Kansas, is one of the least prominent high points in the country. For the first 80 years of its statehood, this was not the recognized high point in Nebraska. That was actually thought to be up north of here in Banner County. But in 1951, two men, Art Henriksen and Claude Alden, brought down a World War I altimeter and made the first determination of height. And they found that this point was higher than that one. Their findings would later be confirmed by the U.S. government. Nebraska's high point is one of these cases where you can't always judge a book by its cover. It is over a mile high. Mount Marcy in New York looks like a mountain, but is actually just over 80 feet shorter than this point here. In fact, the majority of the state high points east of the Mississippi have a lower elevation. While other high points lie close to borders or even on borders, Panorama Point is one of a very select few that lies close to another geographical quirk, a tri-point. In this case, the borders of Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska, which lies right over there. And here we are at the top of Panorama Point, the rooftop of Nebraska. Coming in at 5,429 feet makes this the 20th highest state high point in the USA. I'm Sky Marthale. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Rooftops of America. I'll see you soon. Thank you.